classic bell-shaped curve. Now, this shape, the bell-shaped curve, occurs a lot. It's amazing how often it, when you're collecting data and you plot it, you get that pattern. So you, you might get something like this. Now, you see something where the mode, or modal class in this case, is somewhere in the middle, which it is. It's almost symmetrical. Obviously, it's not symmetrical, but you know, it comes down, goes up, goes down again. So it's got that sort of symmetrical bit. I mean, the, the classic bell shape, the perfect one, is where it's purely symmetrical, and then the, the mean would be the same as the median, would be the same as the mode. They're all sitting in the middle there. Now, ours is not symmetrical, and that's often the case when we're collecting real data but it's, it's almost symmetrical. And the other key thing to look at is actually how it tails off. And it should tail off reasonably rapidly. So it comes down to a low one either side. Well, that then brings us to the normal distribution. And this is the one we're really interested in. This is the probability density function of a normal distribution. So one over sigma root two pi e to the power of minus x minus mu squared over two sigma squared. And mu and sigma squared are mean and variances we're used to seeing. That is with the normal distribution. If we want to say a random variable is normally distributed, this is how we would say it. We'd say n, and the little tilde is just saying, well, this is how it's distributed. N stands for normal. Sometimes you'll see them write the word norm, either way. And then the two key pieces of information. So what's the mean? What's the variance of the distribution? So some characteristics of our normal distribution. So here it is, the classic bell-shaped curve. It's an even function. That's because of the symmetry there, we can see. So function x would equal function minus x. It has a maximum at the average. So in other words, the mode is equal to the mean. And it's symmetric. So it also means the median is equal to the mode and it's equal to the mean. Now here's an interesting one. The points of inflection occur one deviation away. So at one deviation, that's where it changes the concavity on the bell-shaped curve. That's our normal distribution. Let's have a look at the standard normal distribution. The standard one is when we set the average at zero and the variance at one. And we normally represent it with Z, hence where Z scores come from, why we call them Z scores. It simplifies our function a little bit. Because we've made them zero and one, it now just comes down to be one on root two pi e to the power of minus z squared on two. That simplifies that function. So how do we work out probabilities then? You'll notice now I have capital phi. Here it was the small letter phi. Capital phi is now the cumulative distribution function. So that we represent with a capital one, and that's where the probability of z is less than or equal to some value. So that cumulative distribution. And that's what we have to integrate. The curve looks like this. There's the cumulative distribution function. It looks very much like the uh, logistic function that we saw, but it's not quite the same because you remember the logistic function had asymptotes. This one doesn't. It actually reaches one and then stays at one, and down at the bottom here it starts at zero. So it actually is there. It's not asymptotic. But it has that same sort of shape where it inflects in the middle and so on. So integrating that function, and a simple answer to that is it's not possible with what we know. Okay? So all the different functions we know and our techniques that we know, we can't do it. Fortunately, we don't have to do it. Because in statistics, and I guess this is the difference between a mathematician and a statistician. Like a mathematician is interested in how these things are created. So where does it come from, the formulas and things like that. Where the statistician is more interested in the number, the answer. So it's really only interested in the value of the definite integral. It doesn't care what the actual integral is. It wants the answer. That can be estimated with our trapezoidal rule. Again, we don't have to do that 
because if we make it a standard normal distribution well these estimates have been made long ago and we just have a table of values something like this and we just look them up so if I wanted to find the probability that it's less than or equal to 0.25 I'd just go to my table and go oh well there 0.2 and there's 0.05 where does that meet okay the answer is 0.5987 it's a matter of looking up the tables. So using our table, well there's the first thing. The table tells us the probability of z is less than or equal to z. That will be the cumulative distribution function when we plug in the value z. But we need to know this because the tables, because of the symmetry, they don't give us values from negative infinity to positive infinity, they only go from zero because it's symmetric. So why have the whole heap? You only need half of the values. But therefore, if we need to work out negative z, we need a way of doing it, and it will be one minus the cumulative of z. So in other words, what we're saying is z greater than equal then would be the same as the negative z. And if we wanted to work out in between two values, well then we just subtract the two functions. So z2 minus z1. You do see absolute value a bit because you of the symmetry, you say, well, what, what's the probability I go from a y to know, minus one to positive one? You see that a bit. So if you're manipulated, you'd end up with two times that function minus one. Now, of course, some calculators will do it for us. Now, the 100 AU plus, which I, several of us have, that one it will do it on. So if you wanted to do it, mode three and then AC, which I think is all clear, but that puts your calculator into the stats mode. Okay, so you can do it that way. Then you'd go shift one five. That brings up the standard normal distribution menu. Okay, so it brings up the menu. Basically, you'll see there's three things that we'll find for you. You'll see P, Q, and R. P is the one we're looking at. So all those values up there. Q, I don't know if that's real useful. R then is the other way for going bigger than. But I guess the one we're concerned with is, is the P. As then, um, no, don't type in 1 minus 0.25. You choose 1, because that'll be the, the P, and then type in 0.25. It'll find that value we just worked out, 0.59. But you'll notice it's got more decimal places than a table of values, 0.59871. Those of you that have bought the fancy new one, here's how you would do it. So you go to the home screen and choose the distribution menu. I think it's on the far right. Then select normal CD. You've got several options of different distributions you can choose from. You want the normal cumulative distribution, so normal CD. You would select that. Then you have to tell it the limits that you're going from. Now of course we're going from minus infinity and how do you enter minus infinity on a calculator? Well you can't. So what they suggest you do is enter minus 1 times 10 to the 99. Basically it's it's telling the calculator, okay, we, we're pretty much out at the edge there. It's a negative infinity. So that's where you'd enter for the lower bound. The upper bound, well, that's the one we're trying to find. For that, you'd enter 0.25. You then have to tell it what the average of your distribution is. Well, we're working with the normal distribution, so it's zero, but I'm pretty sure that's there by default anyway. Oh, we need to tell it the deviation as well. Uh, so we enter one. Again, that should be there default. Fault. Then we can execute it and it should come up with this answer. Such a time saver, these new calculators. As I say, don't rush out and buy one just because it can do this. It, it, honestly, it's a lot quicker to look up a table of values than to go through all this. So if we wanted to do z less than or equal to 0.44, I have used a calculator for this, so I've got more decimal places in the table of values, but you would get 0.67003. So minus 0.81, if I'm using my tables, I'd go, oh, that's one minus, and I'd look up the 0.81 and we get that answer. Or of course, if I was using the calculator, okay, I could put minus 0 0.081 straight in and get the answer. Between two values, okay, I'll look up 0.94, I'll look up minus 2.34, but remember, to get minus 2.34, I'm gonna have to go one minus 2.34, and then we'd come up with our, our answer. And absolute value one, 
Well, that's one where I go, oh, well, I'll look up 1.15, go two times that, minus one. And we'd, we'd come up with that. It's important we know how to read those tables, I guess, to solve some of these questions. Just finish off with what's called the empirical rule. There it is. Our standard normal distribution. And if it is a normal distribution, then we find 68%. If we were now look up uh, one on our table of values, we'd see that it's, well, whatever, one minus all of that is. But we'd end up with 34% in that area. Uh, going to two deviations, we get 95% of the data. And then virtually all of the data lies within three deviations of the mean. And that's basically, remember, what your Z-scores are saying. Z-scores are saying, well, how many deviations from the mean are you? 16D, our normal distribution.